afternoon. It's an honor to have you tuned in to Hot Issues on TV3 <laughs> week after week. We are grateful for your time. I am Nuong Falong. Today on Hot Issues, we are zooming in on issues with a man who was a former chaplain at the Osu Castle under late President Mills, who was also a very good friend to the late President Mills. He is presently a member of the National Peace Council. Let's welcome Reverend Dr. Ni Amodakun. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. First, let's talk about your book, mm. Born for a Purpose, mm. and I have it right here. Um, what inspiration went into writing this book, and what exactly is the book about? Thank you very much. Now, this is one of nine books okay. that, by the grace of God, I've written over the period. So, so you can, we can call you a writer? Uh, yeah, I'm on an author. On top of your credentials. Yes, yes I'm an author. Um, this is a book that tells the story of my life how I, under God, tried to inspire people to know that no one was born by chance mm. and that everybody has been born for a, a definite purpose. Have you determined what your purpose in life is? Yes, yes, I have, under God, I determined that. Um, <clears throat> I have known uh, that uh, the Lord has called me to stand in the gap for the cause of his kingdom. Uh, in my generation, mm. in my country. And so I have been uh, a prayer warrior for this nation and for the generations in which I live and the ones to come. Uh, I have heralded the gospel of Jesus Christ, which I believe is the one that brings people to where they ought to be, for God to have use of them uh, in whatever situation they find themselves. Now let's go to state affairs. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the, the present state of the Council of State mm. right now. Mm. What do you make of it? Well, the Council of State, uh, as constituted by the constitution of this country, is supposed to cancel the certain president, and then, of course, his vice and uh, ministers and parliamentarians and other stakeholders, uh, as and when they are given the opportunity to do so. Um, from what we are hearing, and uh, know of it, uh, the Council of State sits in camera. So not much is said about what takes place during their meetings. Uh, but from time to time, they meet with the president publicly for the media to cover for a short while. They leave, and then they continue with their discussion over pertinent issues in government or the building of the nation and issues such as that. So from what has prevailed thus far and what we have read and known about it, I would say so far, so good. Do you think their influence has been felt in governance? Well, the, you, you would not be able to tell very much because, you see, uh, under a particular clause in the Constitution, the Council of State would advise. Mm -hmm. But then the prerogative is for the President, the Parliament, or the Minister so advised to take or leave it. And they cannot, you know, push it any further. <laughs> What are your views on, on government's white paper rejecting uh, most of their mill short commission's findings? We need to first, in the, in the first place, congratulate the president mm -hmm. for putting up the commission uh, after the mishaps that happened at, at, at Hawaii also. And so uh, that was a very good thing to do. And then, of course, these are eminent men, tested people in our society uh, who sat over a period and then had all these interviews and all the various things that happened as we saw on television and read also in the newspapers and so on. Um, at the end of the day, they came up with their findings and recommendations. We know that the president has also the right to accept the recommendations that are given or otherwise mm -hmm. in a white paper. And uh, as we know now, the government has come out to reject some aspects of the recommendations. Um, I have been told I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not into any legal issues here, but I've been told that the Emily Shaw's Commission sat as a high court. Uh, they had a right of a high court in sitting. And therefore, if a high court comes up with a ruling, usually I'm told that it is only the appeal court that can negate any such thing ruling. Um, and so for um, what has happened, I think the president has used his own executive powers to say what he has said in the white mm. paper. Mm. And uh, 
I, a lot I, of people think he wasted the, the time of the short commission by having them sit together and bring out findings and then rejecting those findings. Well, I would not say that it was a waste of time. After all, what it did has been documented for posterity. It's, it's there for all to see. And um, what the president has done, if anybody has any, any issues with it, I think that the appropriate places are there to go to and to challenge it uh, so that we do not create a lot of views out of this. Um, if anybody has any difficulty with what the white people have said concerning what the, the recommendations are, I think that they can pick it up at the appropriate quarters. The Peace Council has mm. been sitting on the vigilantism, the whole affair mm. about vigilantism. Mm. Do you think the president should have sought their uh, advice before passing the law against vigilantism? Well, um, I do not think that the president needed to seek our advice. However, the president knew that the National Peace Council Board uh, was in talks with the two major parties, the NDC and the MPP. And so um, even before the, he sent this bill to parliament, we were engaging these two parties already. And so when the, the bill was passed, we, we were privy to a copy of it. We have looked at aspects of it uh, through an eminent member of the National Peace Council, uh, a lawyer by profession, uh, Professor S.K.B. Asante, uh, Dr. S.K.B. Asante, who is also a chief. And so we have looked at what is there, and uh, we have looked at what we've been talking with the two major parties uh, in reference to the works that we've been doing with them. Uh, we think that maybe uh, if, if we were consulted, it would have been good. If you were consulted. If we were consulted. But I didn't think that the president needed to consult us. No, you, but you're saying if you were consulted, it would have been good. Yes. So, so don't you have an issue with him not consulting you? No, we, we wouldn't be able to have an issue. <laughs> he has his own right as the president of the nation to do what he knows is best for the nation. But I'm saying that uh, in the Khan uh, proverb, it says that if, if we as eminent members of the National Peace Council board and then also the parties involved, the MPP and the NDC and the executives who have been joy joining and trying to see a way forward into dealing with this issue, it would have added some more substance to whatever was presented. You see, that's what I mean. And so we Does are looking mean at... What was presented did not have enough substance. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I mean is that maybe uh, it could have redirected the issues in a certain manner. We are still talking. We are still in, in talks with the parties. And then we'll look at what has come. And then we'll see how the way forward should be. Recently, there was a tape that leaked. Um, on this tape, there was, we, we could hear Ofo Swampofu uh, speaking against the chair of the National Peace Council. Mm -hmm. w w you have heard this tape? I, I haven't heard the tape. I haven't heard about it. Okay, you have heard about the contents. Mm. What did you make of it? Well, that is um, what the tape says. That is what uh, they say the tape says. And then he is saying that uh, it's been doctored. Now, I wasn't there. I don't know what he said. And I don't know what whether or not it has been, been doctored. So we'll leave it at the, uh, where it is, because I think they are dealing with it in the courts. And let's see what happens out of that. But, but were you shocked about the contents? Oh, you yes, yes, about yes, obviously. Because uh, given the nature and the personality involved, uh, I know uh, Honorable Ofusampo very well. He's an elder of the Church of Pentecost. Uh, he has been an MP. Uh, at a time when, in 1997, under God, I started a parliamentary Christian fellowship. He was part of it. Mm. Uh, he was a, a party to all of that which has been happening. And so I'd known him as a person and therefore found it very difficult that such utterances would come out of his mouth. So, uh, Professor Santi, the chair of, of the Peace Council, mm. do you think he's delivering on his mandate? Yeah, yeah. So far as I'm concerned and so far as we as a, a, a board are concerned, because you keep seeing his face. You keep seeing him speaking... Uh, for the Peace Council, mm -hmm. because we have chosen that he serves as a face. For example, if you were to ask me questions or issues concerning the Peace Council, I, I will defer it to him on, unless he says, Ni represent me to do this, because we together as a board have decided to do that. And so many times when he speaks, even on his own, 
people tend to say that, oh, the chairman of the Peace Council says this as if the, the Peace Council have mandated them to say it. But he may have said something on his own, not as a chairman of the Peace Council. Now, people are finding it difficult now to separate Professor Emmanuel Asante from the chairman of the Peace Council and who he is as a person, mm. you know. And that you is think there should be a, a distinction? Oh, yeah, definitely. When he goes to speak on his own accord, on the platform, it must be captured as such. When he speaks on the platform of the Peace Council, National Peace Council Board, because you see this, it's a board. We govern, we are the governing board of several other Peace Council units, regionally and district. So we, we, there are people who also speak for their own districts and regions, you know, on issues which are captured as such. So if he speaks for us as a board, which we mandated him to so speak, then of course it must be captured as such. But if he spoke, as Professor Emmanuel Asante, that must also be captured as Reverend Professor Emmanuel Asante's comments. We'll go for a quick commercial break. When we come back, Hot Issues continues. Don't go away. Welcome back. You're watching Hot Issues on TV3. I am Nuong Falong. We're moving into the next phase of the discussion and we're going to zoom in on vigilantism. Reverend Dr. Nia Modako. Um, recently, Vice, uh, sorry, President Mahama, he made some comments accusing the NPP of training thugs somewhere in Esuchari. These thugs, he says, are meant to disrupt uh, 2020 elections. What do you make of his accusations? Well, um, I've also heard about it. Uh, I'm not too sure uh, whether or not I could say that it is a fact, because I don't know where uh, he got his information from. Mm. It could be, it could not be. So you you, you doubt the authenticity of of well, his since, comments? Well, you see, when, when such allegations are made, they need to be proven. Okay. And therefore, until such time that it is proven, uh, you know, clearly that this is the issue, uh, we would just have to take a back seat and wait. So you think former President Mahama needs to prove these allegations? Obviously, obviously, for, for anyone to take him serious and then for us to accept that this is what is happening. In any case, there's a law on vigilantism now. So if any party decides that they are going to train secretly people to come and serve as vigilantes, there's a law there to deal with them. And therefore, I, I think that Ghanaians should be calm and then wait until such time that these things are proven. And indeed, if they happen, the law would have to take its course. We will have to stand by the law of the nation. We, we, are, we, we are a nation which is governed by laws. And therefore, we cannot allow or tolerate just anybody to perform or behave anyhow uh, against what the law clearly says. And therefore, if such, groups, such group is even there, and during elections, they emerge and cause commotion, the law will have to deal with them. Mm. You see, the problem about this nation has always been so. Even though we have the laws, we do not enforce it. The enforcement has always been a problem. And therefore, there is a need for us uh, as a nation to sit up with our security agencies to make sure that the laws of this nation, the excellent laws that have been, you know, over the years uh, given to us as a nation to help us, uh, should be able to uh, serve its purpose by enforcers making sure that it is enforced. The courts, the police, and all the various other security agencies must undertake their job seriously. Still on vigilantism, NPP mm. claims that they have disbanded all vigilante thugs within their influence. Mm. From where you sit, do you believe this? Usually, it is not the party itself that has structured them. Who has? Individuals in the party. And if, if the party the, does not speak against them, that's yeah, an endorsement. Of, of, of obviously. Them. But individuals who are bankrollers of these groups start them. And then the party finds it very difficult to manage it. Because they are working in favor of the parties. Because they are working in favor of the parties. You are right. You know? And therefore, if they say that they have disbanded it, and we are saying that they must be disbanded. I'm saying that we are going to have a final meeting with them. And clearly, in, the, in this final meeting, are you going to be asking for proof to show that they have actually disbanded these groups? We are going to ask for their mandate, their, their authority, their signatures to assent to a court and then to assent to 
the roadmap in so that in the event that any such thing happens someday, then of course they have to be dealt with. What are the penalties? Uh, well, the, the, laws, the law is there to deal with it. The penalties are in the law and therefore the law takes its course. And do you think disbanding vigilante groups uh, are a solution to, to the threat they pose? No, no, not at all, not at all. Like I said earlier on, you, you would disband groups on paper, but then it is another thing for us to be sure. On ground. And that is why the security will have to be alert. Okay. We at the Peace Council, for example, have uh, you know, a roadmap to various places of trouble spots in the country during election periods or even outside of election periods uh, where we, we think that there are trouble spots. These things have been given to the authorities and therefore they have to keep their eyes opened and men on the ground to make sure that these things do not filter into any serious uh, problem for the nation. How much leverage does the Peace Council have since all they can do is advise because the president can say he's not accepting your advice? We do not have any power to take anybody to anywhere but then of course Given who we are and where we have come thus far, people listen to us. People know our credibility. And therefore, if you should take, you know, uh, the advice that we give to you as nothing, uh, people will prove to you that they are, they are listeners. Let's move on to a very interesting topic which has been discussed at length among Ghanaians in the last three weeks, uh, comprehensive sexuality education. <laughs> as a, a man of God, <laughs> what do you make of uh, comprehensive sexuality education because a lot of men of God have come out to slam it. Yes. Well, I would have said that maybe we need to drop the discussion because the president says so long as he remains in office, this thing is not going to fly. Now, that is his words. However, uh, some segment of the society thinks that the, the powers that be who are pushing this thing down on that truth are not willing to give up yet. And therefore, um, something must be done about it. Clearly, if you ask me where I stand uh, about it, I, I do not endorse little children in kindergarten and you know primary schools to be taught things that adults. You see, but but uh, the, the information was that it was going to be tailored to suit different age groups. Why don't you support that? The reason we some of us are skeptical is that. Ghana is not alone in this. Mm. And we've been seeing through social media what has been happening in other countries, in South Africa, in Canada, in, in, even in the UK. Would you believe that? And other such places. And therefore, uh, it is something that we think that uh, being tailored to suit uh, doesn't connote, uh, you know, not doing it to our children. There, there have been some men of God who have said uh, it is a direct act to propagate what they call the gay agenda. Mm. Do you share in these sentiments? Obviously, because you see, the, th the, the truth of the matter is this. You see, if our children are so conscientized, if our children are so brainwashed to accept as a norm all forms of sexuality, what are you telling us? What are you saying to these children? Tolerance, so, perhaps? Teaching them tolerance? Tolerance to accept any form of sexuality. That is not Ghana. That is not our culture. That is not our tradition. Uh, you see, before even these things, Christianity and Islam and all of these other things came into being, our, our elders had a norm, a style, a way of life that kept sanity to prevail in homes mm. and, and in society. So we cannot push these things aside. Let's look at the Electoral Commission and mm. its composition. What do you make of its present composition and, and going into 2020, how ready we are? I know that we have an Electoral Commission in place now uh, whose mandate is to make sure that elections are carried on in this country fairly uh, and in a manner that is acceptable to all. And uh, therefore, uh, we expect that the present EC will do just that as for which reason they are there. A while back, uh, Reverend Palmer Buckle mm. uh, mentioned that 90% of corruption should be blamed on Christians and Muslims because they constitute the majority in this country. Mm. Do you share his sentiments? Yes and no. The two religions uh, happen to be in the majority in terms of who we are as Ghanaians. Yeah. And therefore, if there is so much corruption in this country, then who are the ones who are committing it? The majority. The majority. 
the majority who are in the presidency, the majority who are in the judiciary, the majority who are in the parliament, the majority who are in the churches, the majority who are in the mosque, the majority that are who trickle down to go to the to the various uh, uh, gra grass level groups as market women, market men, and mm. whatever. We are the ones who are doing this kind of behavior. However, it depends on what you, who you call a Christian, a true Christian. Because if a person really knows who or she, he or she is as a Christian, then obviously corruption will not be part of the game to play. You understand? So what it means to me, actually, is that we probably have very little, you know, uh, committed, uh, Bible-believing Christians, spiritual Christians, very little Muslims who are truly aligned to the Quran and what it says about corruption. Most of them probably are just nominal. So you think the Christians who are being corrupt are not actual Yeah, yeah, Christians. yeah. We see we have nominal Christians. Even in the Bible, the Bible teaches that there are three types of people out there who parade themselves as Christians. And there are people who, you know, are nominal. They, have, they claim to have accepted the faith and they claim that they are Christians. But in their heart, they are the ones who are governing. They are the ones who are on the throne. They are the ones who decide whether or not to accept what God is saying, what the Bible teaches, what Jesus, the Spirit, is leading them to. They, they, they decide. But then there are Christians who have dethroned themselves, and the Holy Spirit is in charge and is in control, and they want to do the bidding and the will of God according to the tenets of the Scriptures. Let's stay on corruption. Let's look at uh, the allegations of corruption within government mm. and the handling of these cases. Do you think uh, government has done enough to handle cases of corruption? Well, um, we are hearing about corruption every day, day in, day out. Uh, it's been, are we doing enough to fight it, it? It's been played out at various segments of society. Um, if we were doing enough to stop it, it would have stopped. Hmm. You see, we need to set an example. We need to really make sure that when, when people are found to be, you know, culpable and have, you know, committed the the act of corruption, and have been dealt with, you know, uh, properly, having taken them through the various legal processes, and they are found guilty and dealt with, it will at least put the fear of God in the hearts of people who may be envisaged to want to do it. I, I'm, I'm not too sure whether these, you know, uh, little groupings here and there, security networks and who do some investigations and therefore come out with whatever. Why don't we take this, we process these people to court so that we argue their matter out? And if they are gu if, if not guilty, they are released. So you're saying because if we're doing enough to fight corruption, there wouldn't be corruption. Yeah, it would they, end. They, they, which, they means, uh, uh, which simply means that government is not doing enough to fight corruption. Not just government. All of us are not doing enough. But who has the uh, mandate? The, of course. Obviously, the government has the mandate to do these things. Okay? Corruption is like a cancer. It eats and destroys. You know, and that's what is happening to our system right now. And therefore, clearly, we need a, there's a need for us to be serious about dealing with this thing called corruption. And corruption is a matter of the heart. You see, in the Bible, I'm sorry I have to bring in the Bible, okay. in, 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 in Jeremiah chapter 17, the Bible says in verse 9, that the heart of man is desperately sick, wicked, deceitful above all. Who can see it? There should be an actual commitment to fighting corruption. The way we are grossing over In a way it, that we can all see that. Exactly. And for example, the special prosecutor was put in office for how many um, months now? What has come of that office? What do you, is do you blame that on the special prosecutor? I, no, no, no. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if, for example, if everything had been, you know, given to him, he, was, he has been resourced with the personalities he needs, the resource of money he needs and everything, and people were being prosecuted, whether they are in government or outside of government, whether they are MPP or NDC or whatever, and they are being dealt with because it is our money. It is not MPP money. It is not NDC money. It's it is Ghana money. Ghana money. So we people are dealt with without recourse to party colors. I'm telling you that these things will stop. Let's move on to um, free SHS. Mm. Now, do you think there's anything to review in, in the free SHS system? Well, you know, I, I take the side of the finance minister on this issue. Mm. You see, he had insisted that it is not, it will not be good and proper for people, parents, 
who are well-to-do, who can afford to pay for the fees of their children to go through this kind of free to thing. Benefit from free to education. benefit from the free education thing. So you think it should be reviewed? It should be reviewed. It should be reviewed. I think that it was a, it's a good thing, but the way it's going now, if we are not careful, at a point it will backlash. There will be so many of them churning out that, you know, there will be problems all over. It doesn't matter the creations of institutions to try to, you know, recruit all of them into whatever seg uh, segments of society. It might be a difficult, because you see, listen, I and mean, I don't think that it is, it is serving justice enough. If people have benefited from, uh, from being Ghanaians, okay, some people have been given scholarships to go to various places, have gone through various things, and they have now come into society, they are well-to-do, they are earning decent income, and they can take care of their children. And then they, the children of the peasant farmers and the hardworking, you know, rural community dwellers who are, do not have enough. Children will have to compete, compete with, with these, these children. People. In the meantime, these, their children, the well-to-do children are in schools that will make them get the grace that the peasant children, because of where they are coming from, cannot get. And therefore, at the end of the day, they are not able to, I mean, that is not fair. Something ought to be done. So it ought to be reviewed. It ought to be reviewed. I agree to that. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Ni Amodaku. You're welcome. Let's, let's, let me take you a little back to mm. uh, late President Mills. <laughs> do, you, do you ever miss him? <laughs> I do miss him greatly. He was a man who had a heart for Ghana. Mm. Um, every morning at 6.30 to 7.30, we meet in his bedroom to seek the face of God through the scriptures to find out what Bible says about governance and how he has to play his role in dealing with his ministers, in dealing with governance, in dealing with society. He took decisions based on these things that we learned. And then we would pray. And then we would go to his office around 8.30, pray with the security people and whatever before he starts his work. We did this for three and a half years. My dear, wouldn't I miss him? <laughs> Let's look at the, the ways in which Ghana has chosen to remember him. Yes. Uh, the monuments that have been built, the Asumdre Park, the library. Yes. What, what do you make of their present state? Uh, do I have to talk about them? It is said that a nation that does not honor its heroes and heroes is not worth dying for. I think that is just right that would do what is befitting for, for, for his own person and for posterity. So you think presently we haven't done enough for his legacy? We haven't done enough for his legacy. I mean, what until, until recently, what I was seeing at Asumbue Park wasn't anything to write home about. I hear that the library is on the lock and key. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's not right. It's not right. You see, uh, we, should, we should let go of our pettiness and be a nation. You see, we need to begin to think Ghana, not our parochial, individual, partisan, tribalistic, and other tendencies. Nothing separates us. We are Ghanaians. Being the man that you knew him to be, looking at the state of Ghana right now, do you think he's happy about <laughs> it? Obviously, he wouldn't have stood for things like this. When you say he wouldn't have stood for things like this, what does that mean? Yeah, because everybody saw how Prof. Mills was performing. I mean, when Prof. Mills went to the port and, and these exposés were done, how he handled it and other situations, okay? So he didn't take issues lightly when it came to governance and the well-being of Ghana. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Reverend Dr. Ni Amodaku. Thank you for coming on Hot Issues. Thank you so much. My pleasure. That's how we end this week's edition of Hot Issues on TV3. I am Nuong Falong. We have been speaking with Reverend Ni Amodaku. He has talked about corruption and he has been very emphatic about that. If corruption is being fought, it will be very clear. Thank you for joining us. See you again next week, same time on TV3. Good afternoon.